Okay, this is a little addendum to my Can You Separate Art from the Artist uh, response video to Kevin Tol Toll's video. And I got way off track on the other one. I apologize if you listened to the whole thing. There was another aspect of separating the art and the artist I wanted to discuss, which I think is very important because it's one I haven't heard mentioned yet. So I'll link to part one earlier, I guess. This one will hopefully only be about 10 minutes or so. And I thought of it because Kevin Toll mentions Stephen King. And he that's one person he mentioned in his short video. Again, go watch that. It's called Let Me Know, number three. It's his third Let Me in his series of Let Me Know videos. Let Me Know, three ethics. Could you separate art from the artist? One book he mentioned is... I think it's called Holly or something by uh, by Stephen King. Anyway, it's definitely a Stephen King novel about his his popular character who's been in several of his, his crime books now, Holly Gibney, I think her name is. And Kevin had difficulty reading this book because of Stephen King's not Stephen King's behavior, but because of Stephen King's treatment of the material based on Stephen King's own political views. And I don't want to really comment on Kevin's views or, or, or go into more detail about that because, I, frankly, I don't know what they are. But it did make me think of how I feel about that and it does affect me I'm not as I've said many times on here and people are probably sick of me hearing that you know because I want to I want to be cool so so I got to let everybody know that I don't like Stephen King that much and I do like uh, some of his earlier books I like the the trashier they were you know he should have never stopped doing drugs in my opinion or he should have see I'm already going off track again he should have um uh, once he got off drugs, he should have st he should have sat down and learned how to write. I probably have to explain that for people, but you know, if you read Stephen King's book on writing, he's really just he really just pants it to the nth degree. He's like, I don't want to analyze it, I don't want to think about it, I don't know what I don't want to analyze what the elements of the story are. I don't care about the hero's journey, which is good that he doesn't care about that, but you know. You write, you sit down, you type, and eventually you get to the point where you feel like you're done. And then you go back and you cut out 10%, because in Stephen King's mind, that is revision. Cutting out 10% is the sum total of his revision. Um, you don't think about stuff. He's afraid to think, Stephen King's afraid to think about stuff because he doesn't want to destroy the magic. That's his opinion. I, I think that's a pretty fair statement of Stephen King's opinion of writing. Um, you know, and he's he'll be the first one to say, like, I'm telling you what works for me. I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm not telling you what works for everybody. I'm not making fun of you if you revise your books or if you uh, think about what you're going to type before you start typing. He's he's not ridiculing people for doing that, and he and he has very good taste generally in in writing and in in films and stuff like that. King does, but he doesn't want to he doesn't want to mess with it, and that's what I mean when I say he should have either not. He should have stayed on drugs or he should have changed his, his point of view because when he was on drugs, he was just, um, and drugs and alcohol, speed and coke and whatever else he was doing. He, he was just pouring out of it, you know, and that's not a good way to live. That's not, I don't advocate that for anyone. That'll just wear you down. It'll drive you into the ground. It's why, you know, I just read that, that book, um, uh, Ian Fleming's bi biography. That's why these people in, in the arts, died or stopped creating in their in their mid 50s or the early 50s sometimes because they just drank and smoked the, the life out of themselves so i don't advocate that but i'm but it works for young people some young people um so stephen king pants it how does this relate to my main thought i don't know just my mind's racing today i guess he Oh yeah, so it was just the just the fact that I'm always on here uh, crowing about how I don't like Stephen King, and I got off onto a to a side track of how to um, 
to justify that. But, you know, if you're still watching, if you're still subscribed to this channel, I guess it doesn't bother you that much that I'm really not the world's biggest Stephen King fan. I would love it if there was a new cool Stephen King book. Like his early Bachman books or something. Just something just crazy and full of imagination and, and fun. You know, with, with characters that seem to be drawn from life like they were in his early books. Like Salem's Lot, for example, or uh, The Long Walk, which is the stupidest idea ever. And that, now they're making it into a movie. It's just the stu stupidest version of The Hunger Games slash uh, that kind of thing. I mean, he's obviously The Hunger Games came much later, but but you know, just the stupidest thing. Only like a, a, a young person, he probably thought of the idea, I don't know when he wrote it, but he, pro he probably was like 15 or 16 when he got the idea for that novel. Like, what if we just all walked to death and, you know, and we're just a bunch of high school kids and, and we're just normal kids, but the adults are all picking on us and everything. It's a, it's a great book because it is just, just pure forward emotional energy. So, those are the kind of Stephen King things I like, and he just wrote his way out of them and wasn't able to evolve, in my opinion, to be a mature writer. He just became uh, a lazy, bloated writer, in my opinion. However, uh, Kevin, for example, is a fan of his work, as many, many, many people are, was offended, seemed to be, from his video, I don't want to put words in his mouth, seemed to be put off by Stephen King's overt <clears throat> um, sort of propagandizing, that's my word, that's not Kevin's word, of his own political views and, you know, his, his anti-Trump views, his anti-right-wing uh, views, his anti-gun views, which are sincerely felt by Stephen King and which I probably agree with, but I would hate that as much in a book as much as I hate Stephen King's Twitter. I hate Stephen King's Twitter. I hate Rob Reiner's Twitter. I hate uh, George Takei's Twitter. They are the, and I hate um, Mark Hamill's Twitter. And these are all people marginally, broadly, roughly, but I would argue thoughtlessly, on my side. Uh, and it is a different kind of, <clears throat> can I separate the art from the artist? I get so sick and tired of those people who are famous lecturing to us, even if they're lecturing the stuff I want to hear. Um, you know, I don't agree with everything that they say, but but I'm not, I'm not opposed to them. It's not like I'm, it's not like I'm here an anti-Trump. I would never vote for Trump. I'll disclose that now. I would never vote for Trump. I would either not vote or vote for someone else. Um, And if uh, a person, and I guess the, the, the comparable position would be is if it came out and Stephen King said, oh, you got to be pro-Trump, I'm pro-Trump, vote Trump, vote Trump. Would I change my opinion of them? Uh, maybe, but I'm as equally offended by their, the nonsense, especially during the Biden uh, era when they were pretending, all of them pretending that there was no issues with Biden's uh, mental competence until all of a sudden one day they all decided that there was. Uh, I'm getting off on politics again. <clears throat> so my point is I can even be offended by things that uh, uh, a writer's out of their art behavior can offend me just by the fact that there's so much of it, if that makes sense. It's, you know, there's a, there's a smaller, uh, smaller than Stephen King, but still a guy with a pretty big platform. He's uh, Adam, Adam McKay, I think, the filmmaker. He's going on, and he's very left-wing. He's left of Kamala. He's left of the Democrats. I know that some people watching this have no idea that there could absolutely ever be anything left of Kamala Harris. But there is. There's a, a large, large contingent of people who who think that the Democrats, and I know you'll think this is crazy if you're on the right wing, they think the, the Democrats are too right wing. And they, they know 
we know, I know that Kamala Harris is not some secret communist uh, bent on, you know, raised from birth to destroy the United States like a sleeper agent or something that, that people, that some people who, who do conspiracy theories on the right would like us to believe. Um, oh God, I keep losing my point. You know, I, I make notes, but they don't matter because I go so far off on tangents anyway. <clears throat> So, but anyway, Adam McKay on his thing, so he's always going far, far left. And people, of course, you know, Democrats get mad at him. They're like, you're, you're helping Trump by criticizing Kamala, by criticizing Kamala's Palestine policy, you're helping Trump. And someone, he got into a discussion with someone, they're like, why do, you, why do you bother to do this? Why do you do this? And he said, like, well, and someone, or someone about on his level said, you know, I just feel I have to use my platform. And he said, yeah, that's the thing. I feel like, you know, I have this platform. It's my responsibility to use it. And I know that's what's going on with Stephen King and Rob Reiner and uh, J.K. Rowling, who never tweets about, tweets about anything but trans rights, ever. Stephen King, at least, will tweet about a good Netflix series he saw or his books coming out or, you know, some good books that he read, I'll give him that. Stephen King will tweet about the arts. He will elevate and promote other writers and other creators whose work that he enjoys, which is probably what all these people should just do all the time. All these big accounts who have no business being on social media at all should just tweet and, and elevate, uh, you know, talk about stuff you think is cool. But... It, this is a, more of a question of celebrity than being an artist, I think. It's just they think, oh, you know, I have so many followers. It's, you know, it's everybody's just waiting for me to tell them how to think. And so there is that level of, I would call it hubris. And, you know, there's a lot of Marvel actors who do this. And other people, it's like, just get over yourself. And, they, and they're mostly people I agree with. And, and I get so sick of being... Uh, uh, lectured at by people in the arts people uh who think they know shit because they're good at one thing you know you see this a lot in the you see famous physicists and sociologists and uh, linguists and everything you just they're free to you know they just dive right into politics you know they don't know anything more than you do for the most part stephen king is not any smarter certainly about politics than you are i don't you know, I don't. I'm sure he watches Rachel Maddow or whatever, wherever he gets his stuff. It's pretty clear from his book, Eleven Twenty Two Sixty Three. He does not have deep political thoughts. He does not understand these these um, different situations historically, or you know, that's not what he's into. He likes to read fiction. He likes to read horror novels, he likes to read action novels, he likes to read crime books, he likes to watch all the same trashy Netflix series as we watch. You know, he's not going deep, he's, he's not uh, subscribing to policy journals. He doesn't know anything more about politics than you do. You know, and and maybe if, if you feel his, as I do, you feel his heart is in the right place when it comes to guns and and certain different views of different different controversial issues you know he and you know he once when when texas was having those uh, those power outs power outages in the summer a few years ago right after um what's that guy's name who's who's the the guy the guy from the center from texas who lost to trump last time around or two why can't i think of anybody's name anyway uh so they're having power outages you know people died it was winter cold snap or something like that uh, uh ted cruz went down to the bahamas and you know got busted going you know being on vacation when people in his his state were dying and 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 stephen king wrote a tweet like you know this is what you get Texas for voting red, uh, you know, which is such an offensive thing to say, especially for a man who lives in Maine and Florida. That's where his residences are, 
which are red, which are right-wing states, which means he's basically saying that the same people in his states, you deserve to die if, if you vote for the wrong party. You know, and so that's, I use that as an example of his level of intelligence when it comes to politics. You know, thinking that everybody who lives in Texas deserves to die because the, because the voting trends are 52% red versus blue or something like that. You know, it's just a, an emotional statement I'm sure he made, but I'm just using it as a point that he's no less dumb than you and me. And to bring it back to the actual thing I'm supposed to be talking about, this is, this is one example of a time when I have trouble separating the art from the artist is when they're just in my face all the time. And this is another thing we have to deal with today that we didn't have to because people used to be able to hide a bit more. And more importantly, they had the good sense. You know, there's many writers today that just they're not on Twitter all the time. You know, he doesn't have to tweet that much. And, you know, he's, he's, he, he tells his publisher what to do. He is so rich, he's so powerful, he's so important to his publisher that they don't get to tell him you have to have a Twitter account the way they do with a lot of mid-list authors, you know, and, and he doesn't have to tweet at all. He could tweet when it's fun. He's, he just thinks it's so important that his 5 million followers, or whatever it is, 50 million, it's just, they're just, we're just here hanging. He has to tell us it's more, it's his more responsibility, responsibility to tell us what to think. And I think that's the trap that a lot of them fall into. I have a platform, I have to use it for good. And when maybe the the biggest good would be just just a little humility and realize that maybe you're not the person to talk about this, that there are smart people to, who can talk about this stuff on the left and the right. You know, Stephen King thinks if, if I don't tweet, you know, Tom will be elected, I guess. I don't, I don't know what he thinks. Um, so that is, a, that is kind of our behavior that's not really wrong. It's not immoral, but it is, it does affect my ability to uh, enjoy certain artists. When I, when I see Mark Hamill on something, I think, oh, he's, just waiting to get off work so he can just tell us how how to behave and um, there we're really too much in tune with the people that create the stuff that we like we shouldn't really know that much about them and they shouldn't really want us to know that much about them so that is part of the problem which brings me back to Neil Gaiman and Joss Whedon especially but it is a, a, a particular type of bad behavior that is inexcusable and I don't want to hear any comments about how nothing's been proved in court or that. I mean, Neil, Ga Neil Gaiman has made women, has paid women six-figure checks and has made them sign non-disclosure uh, agreements for those checks and he's been caught on tape negotiating a payment and promising to give to a woman's shelter uh, to this this person that he was speaking to on the tape you know to to compensate her in a way for what he did to her and then not making those payments to that women's shelter uh, but these things hit people worse i think the people that they hit worse uh, because of the way a person like Neil Gaiman or Josh Whedon represents themselves as a, a generally right thinking, uh, you know, it's like I always say, and a lot of people say, just watch out for those male feminists, ladies, because if they're working so hard to tell you what good guys they are, there might be a real mo a different motive rather than just living their life. And you see it time and time again. There's people on the left, that there's men on the left who want to be thought well of and want to be where the hot chicks are. And they'll behave and they'll say what they need to say and they'll do what they need to do and, and they'll construct a different public persona. And a lot of times, you know, they don't even realize they're doing it, I don't think. You know, it's very easy to have ideals and then not live up to them. And that becomes exacerbated the more money you have the more power you have over other people.
you know, most people don't think they're bad people. Most people don't set out to be bad people. You know, just, uh, you know, how many cops think, oh, I want to be a cop so I can beat up on people. No, they think, oh, I want to be a cop so I can be a hero, and then they end up beating up on people. So that's another kind of person uh, in the arts that when I admire them, and it's, it is tougher to watch their work. Another, and what it really comes down to for me in the end, oh my God, another 20 minutes. Is, and this is, this is the evil, the sort of sad human truth about it. And I think this is true of most everyone, certainly true of me. I think it's true of a lot of these cases too really depends on how bad you want to like the person's work. If they really mean a lot to you, you're going to do backflips trying to continue to like them. If they're a person you didn't like to begin with, or if you're a person who's just kind of an arts grifter, who's like always on social media talking about you know, books and how many pages did you write today and, you know, Tell me your saddest query rejection letter. These people, they're all over Twitter constantly. They're doing nothing all day except trying to engagement farm other writers. You know, do you ever feel like an imposter? That's a big one. You know, and, and you know, those people who really don't read that much, don't write that much, don't really have any deep love of writing and the arts, just, but have a huge uh, desire for attention. They take up, up a lot of the space. And and they um, sort of control the narrative online because they're the they're the, the loudest voices, or at least they have been. Like I said, in, I think it was in the other video. I think um, they, I think I think this is fading out. Just it's just unsustainable. Like like I said, the, the Salem witch trials unsustainable. You can't just have everybody be a witch all the time. Um, you know, and, you know, it's like the McCarthy hearings too. They just, they just started accusing too many people, and then the people with real power start to realize, well, I'm going to be on the chopping block pretty soon, so we better put a damper on this. Uh, but it does. But there are people that you know whose whose work that I've loved in the past. I really can't think of any writers because. Uh, I guess maybe Asimov a little. It wasn't really pleasant to hear that he would like grab asses and stuff and and make people feel really uncomfortable and and use his kind of celebrity and like oh look at me I'm just a dirty old man kind of way. But I haven't reread Asimov since I I learned out learned that kind of stuff. Um, Woody Allen is one that I always bring up because you know originally I didn't want to believe the allegations. That documentary came out. They seemed pretty credible. Even if you even if you skip the the pedophilia allegations just his his regular on the record behavior of marrying his longtime companion's daughter who he's known since the age of 15 or whatever just so repulsive but I liked his movies growing up a lot and I I kept watching them and I still watch them and I but I don't have the the pure joy that I used to have and I watch them kind of there's a certain point what I'm trying to get at there's a certain point when you know enough about a writer uh, that you can't help but see their work differently one jo- one thing that kind of came out was the there's a, a old Bill Cosby bit about Spanish Fly which was which is uh, you know when he when his, all his rape allegations and all his abuse allegations came out <clears throat> that were unfortunately for most of his victims it was beyond the statute of limitations they went out and somebody started playing this old bit he used to do called Spanish Fly, which was him and and uh, someone else looking for Spanish Fly in Mexico. And Spanish Fly, I think, is an aphrodisiac. I don't know if it's a real thing or not. or But at least that's what it was represented. I used to hear a lot about it in the 50s, in the 60s and stuff when I was a little kid. I think it's some kind of powder or something some that's supposed to make you horny. And I guess you give it to women to make them horny. You know, this is way, way back. And and the the joke, the bit in the Spanish fly bit that Bill Cosby would do 
is you know he's someplace down in Mexico or something, and, and he and his uh, his co-star from I Spy heard that they could buy Spanish fly, and they're just looking for Spanish fly. And they're, oh, we want the Spanish fly. We want to buy the Spanish fly, but they didn't know what it was. They just knew it was something sexy, something horny, something dirty. And you know, you do listen to something like that differently now because it seems just like like a benign bit about. A guy in a foreign country who's heard about this sexy thing, this uh, aphrodisiac, some kind of thing, and just wanting to buy some without even knowing what it is. But now you you know he's the type of person who likes to drug people and, and make them unconscious so he can have his way with them for all night. And then, and uh, so if if that makes sense, that's what I'm getting back with Woody Allen. You see, thing I see things in his work now that I wouldn't have seen. If I didn't hold these other opinions of him, so on one hand, I think it's inevitable that that you can't not entirely separate the art from the artist because you know about them. You know, when I read Howard, um, Robert Howard, I know he killed himself at thirty years old. You know, you can forget that through the most exciting parts of the story and all that, but you know, it's it's. It's a fact of life that I know. It's a di- and it makes me approach his works differently than I might if I, he had written his Conan stories and then lived another 40 years writing historical novels or whatever or just giving up writing altogether. It, it can't help but change your opinion. Um, as far as canceling an opinion, I don't know that I've ever gone as far as like, I can. this person I used to love, I cannot write... I cannot read them anymore. I would probably just sort of try and, you know, without even wanting to, I'd probably rationalize it. You know, I went through this a little bit with P.G. Woodhouse because, you know, I loved all his books and everything. And I heard this this uh, stuff that he had been involved with where he had done a couple of... Pro- when he was he was in France when, when the occupation, when the Germans invaded France. So he was 59 years old. He got taken to a prison camp for civilians under 60 his wife got put in a hotel when he turned 60 he got he got put in a hotel too Um, the Germans uh, wanted to use him as a propaganda tool you know to show how well treated he was so he did a couple recordings for them not on political uh, subjects he thought you know he was just doing he was just making he was doing what he always did I'm just stiff upper lipping it you know, I, I'm here in Nazi-occupied France, and, and uh, you know, but of course, people uh, in Germany, you know, imagine if today you're, you know, t- if today we're at war with some other country, and you see somebody uh, giving little comedy bits from your hated enemy, uh, you know, I'm satisfied. Uh, you know, you look at the whole of P.G. Woodhouse's life and his. Not not just his writing, but also his letters and everything. He just was really kind of naive and and uncaring about this kind of stuff. So uh, it was it was a big mistake. He paid a price for it in his life. It doesn't really affect his writing that much. It doesn't affect how I feel about his writing. Wish he hadn't done it. Definitely. You know, I wish H.P. Uh, Lovecraft wasn't worried about the global Jewish conspiracy, but he was. You know, he thought that was a real thing. And so in, the, in those far-flung cases, it, it never really affects me, no matter what, how, what a horrible thing they did. What, what if it turned out that, that Conan Doyle was uh, Jack the Ripper, you know, or something? I wouldn't be like, I wouldn't burn my Sherlock Holmes books. I'd be very interested to read more about them and the evidence, and I'd probably read them in a different way, though. You know, if I found out somebody today was a serial killer, probably would stop reading them, but it's it's never that much of a cut-and-dried case. It's always, you know, nobody's ever on film. Well, maybe. Maybe some of these rappers are on film. We don't know. We'll find out soon. Um, nobody's really on film doing their sexual harassment and their horrible things. Uh, sometimes they're on audio, like Neil Gaiman was caught doing, but... You know, it's always going to be an edge case. You're always going to be able to rationalize your way out of it. So as a practical matter, it does not affect 
how I read a writer. It probably would affect how I would approach a writer who I hadn't read. You know, uh, probably wouldn't start reading Neil Gaiman now because there's so much else to read. And if I did, it would probably be out of a more of a morbid curiosity rather than just hearing he's a good writer. But, you know, that's where I, I end on it. Uh, this is an hour on this subject. If you've gotten this far, I thank you. Uh, I don't know why you would have, though. Uh, like and subscribe. Go to Kevin Towell's uh, page. Like and subscribe that. Uh, he should have more subscribers. Like and subscribe Steve Donahue's stream. Just for the hell of it. Just so we can get him to 20,000 and make him answer a bunch more questions. All right. Talk to you later, YouTube.